one and everyone. Thank you, Carla, for blessing us with your music this morning, getting us started in worship. Praise be unto you from God our Father and from His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are so happy to be in worship. I want to welcome everyone who has joined us by our website and also by YouTube. And other means that you might have in joining us this morning, we welcome you. Again, we want to thank Deacon Garner for playing for us this morning. Brother Michael Harris for working in the video room. And thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we pray that this worship service might truly be a blessing to everyone who is exposed to it. I also want to thank you for praying for us during the week as we administered various capacities of ministry. Um, our church is still alive. Our church is still functioning. Uh, we are not able to gather as we wish, but we want you to know that the Holy Spirit is still working. And so we praise God for your support and for your prayers. Pray that you continue to call each other up and support each other in your prayers and, and your concerns and in your ministries as well. We also want to thank all of you for your faithfulness and support in giving. We've been able to carry on our ministries because our church family has been very faithful in giving. And our prayer is, is that God would intervene and bring an end to this pandemic so that we can gather together and worship again. So keep us in prayer. Also invite you to join us on Sunday morning. We have a Zoom Sunday school class at 11 o'clock. If you'd like to join us for that class, you have to text us or send to the office your email address so that we can get you online. We have a special treat this morning. We have a guest speaker, Dr. Vincent Baker, Associate Professor of Theology and the Director of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College has consented to join us. Always a privilege and glad to have him accept our invitation to preach for us. We know that God will bless you as he will preach for us. He has blessed us in the past as he's been our preacher. And so we pray that you would open your hearts, your minds, and your spirit to receive what God has for you through this God man as he'll preach for us this morning. Dr. Vincent Baker, come as the Lord lead you. God bless you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for that introduction, and it is always a privilege uh, to preach here at Bellevue. Our text is from 1 Peter, and the uh, chapter is chapter 1, and verses 13 through 25. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. So I'll read this. Uh, this is from the NIV. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. If you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word that was preached to you. 
Let us pray. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds. May all who hear your word encounter your word. May they be those who do not just have an encounter with it, but receive it. Pray that it would sink deep within and that you would bring forth fruit in, in the lives of those who encounter your word. We pray that you would lower any inhibitions, that you would make everyone sensitive to hearing what you have for them. This we pray in Christ's name, amen. What makes Christians different? On the one hand, sometimes you want to say what makes us like other people when we would talk about being human like other humans, whether they are Christian or not. But today I want to ask about what makes us different? Not everything that makes us different, but at least from this chapter, this, this part of this chapter, what makes us different? You have to understand with this text that this is an audience that knew that they were different. They knew they were different because you can look at the beginning of the book and see that they knew they were different because Peter is writing to people, he says, people who are exiles scattered throughout various provinces, he has at the beginning of the book of 1 Peter. And it's not just that they were Christians who were scattered in places beyond Israel, it's that they were Christians who were scattered beyond Israel. And that where they were, it's not just that they weren't at home perhaps ethnically or culturally, but it's also because they are those who are committed to Christ. And they are those who are committed to Christ in a setting where most of the people are not people who are committed to Christ. And they are people who might regard these Christians as suspect because of their ultimate commitment to Jesus rather than their commitment to the Roman Empire. So they knew that they were different. They were having an exile experience. They knew that they were others among everybody else in these various places where they were scattered. And they were outsiders who were facing trials. You read further along, he says that in these times they were experiencing trials. So their identity and their experience was telling them that they were different. And the central thing about their difference is that they were Christians. Trials are hard, but trials provide opportunity. We are not facing the trials that they faced. We are not in the Mediterranean. We are not in the first century, and we are not in the Roman Empire. We are in the United States in 2020 during a worldwide pandemic and during a time where there is in the United States a heightened attention to questions of race and where, they, and where there is lots of division of various kinds in our country. We're in a different time, but it is a time when we still need to ask, what makes Christians different? This is why the title of the message is Our Distinctive Path. And from this text, there's some aspects I want to highlight and lift out. Three points today, one of those three-point sermons. In these three points, three different things about us that make us distinctive. Because when you are distinctive, you are standing out. If you are distinctive, there's something about you that's going to make you different from the others. So what makes Christians different? What is it that is making us 
distinctive. What is our distinctive path? Three characteristics I'd like to highlight for us in this text. First, from our first point comes from verses 13 through 15. And the, and the heading for that point, if you're taking notes, is this. The heading is our distinctive vision. Our distinctive vision. And there are three dimensions I want to highlight. The point isn't to talk about every single thing in the text, but I want to talk about certain things in the text that emphasize our distinctive vision in this point. First, notice that he says we have to have a clear mind. This is the first part about our having a distinctive vision. He says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. If you are alert, that means that you are paying attention. It means your antenna is up. It means you're at the ready to notice something. It's very different than if you're not alert. You can be present, but not be alert. You can be present and all focused on yourself and not looking for anything. But he says to be alert, be on the lookout for something. But here's the thing. It's hard to be alert if you're not sober because you might think that you're being alert, but if you're not quite clear in the head, if something has intoxicated you in some way, saturated you in some way, then you're not gonna be able to be alert and have the kind of mind you need to pay attention. We have to be people with a clear head in order to be those who are attentive. In fact, I would say the precondition of being alert is being sober. Now, perhaps some of you have been around people who've had a little bit to drink, or maybe a lot, or who've been on other substances, or maybe just somebody, you know, you went to the hospital, they, they had surgery and they were under anesthesia, and you, were, and you were with them a little while after they came out, and now they're letting them see, be seen by others. And you might recall that in any of those situations, if they're still a high enough content of something in their system, their perception is not normal perception. They don't see things like they ought to see things. Even if they see you, they might, they might even recognize you, but the way that they talk to you and respond to you will be a little bit different. You know, uh, I have had two carpal tunnel surgeries, and you had to go under anesthesia for those, and I'll never forget it, uh, you know, coming out of them because I definitely uh, was not completely clear. It took a while before I had my clear sense of vision. So and I just note that to say, that, you know, there's all kinds of things. It doesn't have to actually be something that's like a drug. That can be something that is clouding your vision. That can be something else that is saturating your mind and keeping you from being properly sober, having the sobriety you need to have the kind of attention that we need. And, and so think about it this way. It's kind of hard or ridiculous, let's say even, to talk about having a distinctive vision if you don't have the capacity to see at all. So you have to have the conditions in place to be able to have a vision. So the, the, you have to have a clear state of mind if you're going to have a vision at all, much less a distinctive vision. So you have to have a clear state of mind. And second, you have to have a primary focus. Now he says to them, to, to be alert and sober about what? He talks about when, be, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, at the very least, the point is this. Whether they are alive when Jesus comes back or not, they need to be people who are looking up in the right sense, 
because they're waiting for him to return. Now, earlier in this chapter, he says that this is an audience of people who have heard the gospel, but they haven't been introduced to the gospel until after the ascension of Jesus. So he says, you believe in him, though you have not yet seen him. You love him, though you have not yet seen him. You trusted the witnesses and you believed the witnesses. And so you are believers, you are Christians, you belong to him. But, and he says that Jesus in whom you believe is going to return because he said he's coming back. And the thing is, he never said when it was. He has said, I am coming back. And he sometimes said soon, but you have to understand, you read in the Bible, it's obvious that soon from God's point of view is not soon in terms of the way that we think about soon. But he's telling them, because you don't know when it's gonna go down, you've got to always be aware and looking for it. And the point is, you're not just looking for anything, you're looking for him. You're looking for that one person, the person that you believe in, but you haven't met him in person yet, but, but you're going to meet him in person when he returns. Set your mind on him. Make him your primary focus. You've learned about him, so you've learned what God has revealed to him through the word and through the witness and the life of Jesus, and you're going to see a greater revelation when the whole world sees him when he comes back. So have your vision set on Jesus. Now it's important to note, and I'll say more about it at the end, the point about this looking up and this being attentive doesn't mean ignore where you are. But it does mean that your priorities are straight and that Jesus is the center of your priorities. And that when you're thinking about how you're going about whatever you're going about, he's number one. He's number one. He's the center of your vision. We could call it a Christocentric vision, a Christ-centered vision. The focus is on him. And of course, you gotta have a clear mind. It's gotta be on him. And it has to have with it also a commitment to a certain kind of life. Because he doesn't just say, just look up and just sit around looking up all the time. He says that as obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. In other words, you lived one way, with one kind of commitment, letting desires characterized by loving things in the world more than loving God. And, and he said, look, you were ignorant. You, you, it's all you knew to do, but now you know better because you met Jesus. And he said, but just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. Because God says, be holy because I am holy. What does God mean? God says, I'm a holy God, live like you belong to me. So your commitment in this vision is a commitment to life with God, a commitment to holiness. I, you know, I sometimes say to my students, I say, you know, I wonder how many of you, you're happy to say, I am happy to be like Jesus. But if I asked you, are you happy to be holy, would you pause because being holy just seems being weird? Because you're like, well, I've known some uh, holiness folk. And because I've known some holiness folk, you know, uh, they're kind of strange. They're weird. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be a freak, you see. But I want to be like Jesus, you see. You can't be like Jesus and not be committed to a life of holiness. Because what holiness is, is not the specifics of what one group has said about what it means to look like a holy person. It means at the end of the day, living like you belong to God. To be holy is to be set apart, to belong. If you belong to him, then you're holy. So live like you belong to him. So our distinctive vision, you gotta have a clear state of mind focused on Jesus committed to a holy life. A distinctive vision where people know you're on the alert, for whom you're on the alert, 
and how you live in the meantime. What's your state of mind? What's your focus? What are the potential intoxicants for you that cl cloud your vision? What's your focus? Is there something other than Jesus that's number one when it comes to your vision? What is your central life commitment? Who you want to be like? To whom do you want to live like to whom you belong? Like you belong to God or like you belong to some other kind of belonging? When I ask these questions, I ask myself, just like I ask you, because we have to ask it every day. Because there are all kinds of things, you know, while we wait for Jesus to return that say, you know, belonging to me is pretty much like belonging to God. You can't get any better than being like us. Don't you want to be like us? So uh, God says, uh, it might be okay to be a part of that, whatever it is, but don't worship that. You need to worship me, and your central commitment needs to be belonging to me. What's your commitment? What's your vision? Point number two, we have a distinctive salvation. Our distinctive salvation, verses 70 to 21. Oh, now, you might say, uh, distinctive salvation. Does anybody talk about salvation other than Christians? Yes, they do. They might not call it salvation, but it is. Everybody is subject to people all the time telling you, come to me or come to this or participate in this or buy this, become a part of this, and you will be saved. Now, they may not say, I'm saving you using that vocabulary, but it's what they mean because what they are offering to you is saying, if you want the real life, if you want what you've always desired, if you want what is going to take you to the promised land, then what you must do is come to fill in the blank and you too will have salvation. So there are other salvations on offer of all kinds, not just other religions, but things that are happy to replace religion. So yes, a distinctive salvation because there are others on offer. And during that time in which this was written, live under Caesar, for he is the king. He is the savior. He's like a god. So it is indeed a distinctive salvation that we are talking about. Well, what about this distinctive salvation? Three points here. The first is this. This salvation is distinctive because of its unique high cost Amen. is unique high cost he says going to verse 18 for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed now isn't it interesting they says you weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold now uh, we've all seen situations at least in film and television and other forms of video, and you've probably read about it in books, that if there's a pot of gold somewhere, and, or a treasure chest with gold and silver, or gold, silver, and pieces of eight, I mean, you, you know, whatever it is, what, what do people do if it's one of those moments where all of a sudden the gold coins spilled? What does everybody, does everybody go, oh, just some gold coins, this bill. Is that what they do, right? Especially if it's like a situation where, let's say there's a truck that happens to have a, tr a chest with gold in it, and the chest falls out, and then it opens up, and gold coins spill out. What do you think people are going to do? You're either going to go, oh, it's just perishable stuff. Just keep driving, right? No, no, no. You, it, people are going to stop and get out and then they're gonna start grabbing for it. Why? Because they say, oh, it's gold, it's so valuable. Same thing if it's silver, same thing if it's diamonds. 
Yet, what is being said here? These are perishable things. And it is interesting to observe, by the way, that even the nicest gold or silver, what happens to it if you leave it out and expose and you don't spend time shining it up? It starts to change its color, right? And, and you know, you gotta put in some effort for it to show what it's, show it's worth, right? To show, to, for it to be gleaming again, for, for it to blow your mind again. I mean, it's telling you that what? This is not exactly what you think it is, if you're giving it ultimate value. Yet we give these things value, and, and, and from what do we get these things? We get these things from the earth. Who made the earth? God made the earth. Right, okay, so God made the earth, and uh, people are often acting like the most valuable thing in the world is something God made. And, and if you think about it, if people think that they're in a desperate situation, you know, like they really need to get saved because they're uh, in duress, well, they, they might think, you know, if I just had some silver and gold that I could give to them, they might let me off. It might solve my problems, right? Or something like silver and gold, people think will solve their problem. The point is this, is that silver and gold is not going to solve the problem we have when it comes to being saved. Because the problem we have when it comes to being saved is about a broken world, a breach between God over here and humans over here with sin in the middle, and you can't buy your way back to God. You can't say, God, let me give you something from your creation. If I give you enough of that, maybe we'll be okay. God said, that's not how it works. Because it's got to involve you, not something that you're taking from the creation. It's, you know, I, it's, we have to have the relationship Addressed, And you can't go get something else from what I've created and use that to say, and say, here it is, isn't that enough? No, what God has said is, God said, I've provided what you need so that this relationship can be reconciled, so it can be resolved, so that there can be salvation. Because you're going to be lost if you're disconnected from me and you can't buy your way to that connection because you can give me stuff and say, I'll give you all this stuff, but I will not give you myself. Oh, and God says, it's you I want. Oh, it's you I want. I want your life. I don't want your stuff. Now, I want you to serve me with your stuff if you got it. Don't get me wrong. But it's you that I want. I, God has said, I want a people for myself. You can't buy your way to that. And these perishable things, things that we think are so valuable, they won't do it. But God provided something that would, which is the precious blood of the spotless lamb who is Jesus. Jesus, who took on flesh, stood in our place, and made the reconciliation possible. All the things in the sacrificial system leading up to that pointed towards him, the ultimate sacrifice, as it tells us in Hebrews. The once for all sacrifice where he's the one that goes into the heavenly holy of holies for us, making our salvation possible. And he can go in there because he's got the perfect, precious blood that we need to pay the price that we cannot pay, and that silver and gold surely cannot. Our distinctive salvation has a high and unique cost. It also has a distinct eternal purpose because Christ has an eternal purpose. Why do I call it an eternal purpose? Because it says, Jesus, who's this precious lamb, it says, verse 20, he was chosen before the creation of the world. Revealed in these last times for your sake. The point is this, 
God had a purpose before there was a creation, and that purpose that he had before he had a creation was that Jesus was always going to be the one who made it possible for humans to be right with him. You know, there's a, uh, a theologian that I do not often quote. Uh, his name is Karl Barth, very famous Swiss theologian. Actually, he's the most prominent, successful in terms of like influence, I think, Protestant theologian of the 20th century. Um, he always said that, you know, God's ultimate purpose was to be for us in Christ Jesus. And that's what this is saying, right? This eternal purpose in Christ. In other words, here's the thing. If Jesus is the one who's central to this salvation, and Jesus is the one that God chose from eternity past, I mean, how could anything be greater than Jesus? How could something in the creation, apart from God being involved, do the trick for saving us? It cannot. It cannot. But there are false messiahs everywhere saying, well, I come from the creation, but trust me, I will take you above it. And I will save you. If you just follow me, just you know, buy my program, just do my teachings, just you know, send me your money, or just dedicate your life to me. Just do what I tell you, and you will have the life you've always wanted. You will not. You will not. Because those people did not create you. They don't know what your purpose is supposed to be as a human being. But God, who did make all of this and who purposed to be for us in Christ before he even made it all, he knows what we need. He knows what our purpose ought to be. He knows what humans need. Other people pr create fake versions of what that's supposed to be and try to stand in the place of Jesus. They can't do it. That's why this is a distinctive salvation because the high cost of the blood of Christ, the eternal purpose of Christ, and third, the vital, important, significant belief. And the belief, he says, right? Verse 21, through him, Jesus, you believe in God who raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him so your faith and hope are in God. The whole point is, when they learned about Jesus, what is it that they're believing about Jesus? This is important. Because is it just okay to just believe certain things about Jesus? No, that's not the point. Because there are a lot of people who, people who believe things about Jesus, they believe he was cool. In fact, a lot of people like to say, well, you know, if more people were like Jesus, what they really mean when they say this, if more people like Jesus, they would just see the world as I see it. Or if more people like Jesus, they would just be nicer. Or if more people like Jesus, they would never judge anybody. Or at least not judge the things I don't think people ought to be judging. People, people say all these kinds of things. Or they just think that Jesus is a nice, cool, hippie kind of figure uh, who will uh, be nice to you, and it's cool to kind of hang out with him but he doesn't make demands on you. Oh, he does. Jesus made demands on people all the time. And he says, follow me. He says, give your life to me. He says, trust me. He says, submit to me. He says, yield to me. He says, give your life to me. And when he says that, he's saying, when you are following me, when you're giving your life to me, what it means is, you understand that the second member of the Trinity took on flesh, what we call the incarnation, becoming flesh, born as a baby, living a perfect human life, and he's in the right bloodline because he's the son of David, so he can sit on the throne. This perfect son of David dies for us like a common criminal where people aren't really believing he is who he said he was. And then God raises him up and raises him to life and then he ascends and he's coming back. And he says, you understand that this is who this is. And this is the one to whom 
you must give your life. This is the one in whom you must believe from incarnation through death, resurrection, ascension, and anticipating his return. This is the important vital belief. That when you say yes to Jesus, you know who you're talking about. Not a version of Jesus that is edited to my specifications, but the version of Jesus that God revealed that I need to learn about, believe, and then I need to follow him, give my life to him, and let him do his work within me. We have a distinctive salvation with a high cost, an eternal purpose in Christ, and a vital, important, unique belief. What value do you place on salvation? Look around your house. Look at what you drive, look at what you wear, look at what you, in, in what you invest. And I'm not saying don't drive anything, don't live anywhere, don't wear anything nice. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying don't make investments, but how do you value those things compared to the way you value Christ and the salvation that he has made possible for us? What value do you place on salvation? What does your life say about wh on what you put your value? You know, we're in this era of what they call the curated self. I mean, there's always been the curated self, people who've cultivated an image, but now because of social media, we're able to all curate an image and selectively present ourselves in different kinds of things. And of course, because you always make choices about the, the version of yourself you present to other people and there are a lot of people who think that, you know, now I can really be a somebody because I can, I can curate a self that I present to others, that in presenting it to others, people will see that I'm really a somebody, and I'm really somebody that's got it made. And the point I want to make about this is, you know, look, I'm not saying avoid social media, though sometimes I think you should, and it's good to fast on social media at times, but I am saying that if you think you're going to save yourself by curating yourself, you are making a mistake. You are making a mistake. Go ahead and curate yourself. But remember that that's not all of who you are to begin with, because God knows who all of you, who you are. And you should never let that be something that makes you think that now I really live because I've created a version of myself to get followers to admire me and think I'm a, a special something. God already said you're special. He said, I made you. I said, you're part of my very good creation. If you're a Christian, I said, you're my child. And because I say all that, you're more valuable than you can imagine. You are more known and more loved and more cared for than you can imagine. That's what God says to all of us about who we are. We don't need to work our way to the love of God or work our way to significance. God says, I've given you your significance, especially when we belong to him is one of the benefits of our distinctive salvation. The third point is we have a distinctive lifestyle. Amen. First, he says, because they believe, you purify yourself, verse 22, uh, by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, that he says, you are to love one another deeply from the heart. So there is a distinctive lifestyle. First, it's characterized by a life of love for the community. Now, it, it doesn't tell us here in the text how they lived w among themselves and with each other before they became Christians. But I do wonder, because he says love each other and love each other deeply from the heart, uh, if the way that people lived with each other was um, you sometimes will love people but it was always one of those relationships that had uh, a certain kind of uh, agreement with it, which was, um, I'll love you as a friend as long as it works out well for me. I'll love you uh, as long as we agree about everything. I'll love you as long as I like the way you look. 
or these days, I love you as long as you vote the way that I vote, or you live the way that I want to live, that you value what I value. I'll love you if types of relationships. Maybe that's what they were living in. And of course, uh, if that's what they were living in, uh, it's not something that has really changed a whole lot since those days because we're still in that era. And here he's saying that at least among the Christians, it ought to be clear that they love each other deeply. Now, of course, they should be loving everybody, love all your neighbors, seek the good of all your neighbors. But one of the things that ought to make them stand out is that as a distinctive community is that look at how they live with each other. Not how they live with each other just because they've all gotten together, but probably how do they love each other when it's clear that they don't have it all together? Do they live in such a way that they're always seeking the good of each other and that they're, when they have a conflict, when they learn some surprising information that's not pleasant about something, is their way of going about it to say, okay, I just need to admit to you this is hard, but I'm not checking out of this relationship. I'll admit to you, I got a disagreement with you, or maybe a strong one, but I'm not checking out of this relationship. I got to admit to you that I really don't know what you're talking about, but I'm not getting out of this relationship. I'm going to seek your good and love you deeply. Because this isn't just about how you feel emotionally, but it's about the commitment of your life in practice. Look, anybody is easy to love when there's no conflict. Everybody's easy to love when it suits our purposes. But what about when it doesn't? And let me just be personal here. What about uh, when there are people you know, <clears throat> uh, or, or at least know via social media in the case that I'm thinking about, that you know they're Christians and you know they are lying about other Christians because they disagree with them about something politically or culturally? Or they state strong opinions about things, and you're thinking, what, what is up with you? Why are you doing all of this? Or they're so sure about everything that, uh, that they, in terms of the way they see the world, that they pass judgment on other people because they don't see things about the pandemic or about justice. If, if you don't see it the way they see it, then there's something wrong with you. They make statements about it. Now, what do I do when people do that? And maybe if it's somebody I know specifically that does it, or, more, or a lot of people I know that do that. What am I supposed to do according to this verse? I'll tell you what I'm not supposed to do is to think, man, I am really tired of them. And I'm so upset with them. And I'm so mad with them. And I just want to, let's use the word everybody's been talking about these days, I just want to cancel them. Here's the whole point. There is no canceling of the other in the body of Christ. Amen. Especially when we all should have been canceled because of our sin. And God said, I'm, like, I'm giving you the opportunity for life, though you deserve to be canceled. Right. What we are supposed to do are to be what? Those who love deeply from the heart. Not once people have met certain qualifications of agreement or being uh, you know, uh, of a certain disposition or because they're always nice, whatever. No, love them, period. There's no asterisks here. Nothing about, well, as long as um, their personality is just like mine. As long as they, you know, talk about the right politicians as long as they report the right responses to the pandemic, or what I think are the right responses to the pandemic, then I'm happy to love them deep in the heart. Nope, it's perhaps especially those people who are the ones where you might wanna say, Lord, what I wanna pray for these people is not really very positive right now. I want to pray, I want you to fix them. And I don't mean get them right, I mean fix them. Okay, I want you to kind of, want you to kind of work them over, Lord. It's kind of what I want you to do. The point is that when you feel that way, and maybe you have felt that way at least once in your life, uh, that when you're feeling that way, you still need to be asking God, God, help 
me love them deeply from the heart. Help me seek their good, seek the good for them, seek the good of their family, seek their flourishing, their transformation into Christ likeness in the way that God sees what Christ likeness is, not the way that I see what it is. This is what I must be praying for them, to love them deeply from the heart. Now, Christians were known for doing that, just that. Just that. You think anybody would think that Christians are crazy people and undesirable and mean people? They would not. They would say, man, those Christians. I mean, you know, they got some people in there that are like pieces of work. But they don't abandon those people. They keep treating them with love. What's up with that? And And the Christians can say, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about somebody I've met. Because if it was up to me, I wouldn't do it. But because of, of who I've met, mm-hmm. now I'm finding myself with an inclination to love people that I would not love otherwise. Right. But that's what he's done within me because they would not. This is the second point about the distinctive lifestyle. They wouldn't have that life if they didn't have new life. If they were not made alive. If they were not converted, made born again. It's made them new people new people with a new capacity for love. And it's a life that comes from God's power and his word that is eternal and imperishable. He says, for you've been born again, it's new life. And then not a perishable seed, but an imperishable through the living and abundant word of God. And in contrast to people who are like grass, the word of God goes on forever. God is eternal. God is all powerful. God's word is from everlasting to everlasting. This is the God who's made it possible for us to be these people who can love deeply from the heart. The one who's made it possible for us to be born again. The one who started something and is going to finish it. And so this imperishable word is the word that we need. Again, there's lots of words other people want to give you, but those words are going to perish. But the word that is the word of salvation is a word that goes on forever and ever and ever. There's no expiration date. The word of God with its power, with its eternality, is that which gives us life. That is the basis of our salvation. So we have a distinctive lifestyle rooted in a distinctive source. So friends, what makes us different? Do you have a distinctive vision? Do you appreciate a distinctive salvation? Are you asking God to help you live a distinctive lifestyle of love? Oh, if this is who we were, people would say, Those Christians are the ones that we need. Those Christians are the ones who are to be showing us the way because I'm looking around in this pandemic and everybody's losing their mind, but they're not losing their minds. They're the most hopeful people, the most loving people, the most strangely sane people. I don't get it. And we can say, we'll help you get it because we'll introduce you to Jesus. The Jesus who's central to our distinctive vision. The Jesus who's central in terms of the eternal purpose connected to our salvation. The Jesus who gives us the life that we have that can be expressed in a distinctive way. We have a distinctive path that is a distinctive path of hope. If you're watching this and you want to know who this Jesus is, you can know him personally. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. He says, I am the way to your salvation. Give your life to me. You don't have to be perfect to come to me. Let me work on you wherever you are. But come to me, I will give you life. Recognize your need for me because of sin and give your life to me. 
because I gave my life for you so that you can be reconciled to God. This is what is possible for all of us. The possibility of a new and true life that puts us on a distinctive path. Let us pray. God, thank you for a distinctive path that we can have because of our salvation, that we can have a distinctive vision, that we can have a distinctive lifestyle. Help us, Lord, especially now, when there's so much stressing and distressing us. Lord, it's hard in these days. It's hard when it's not these days, but it's especially hard now. Lord, I pray that you would work in and through and among your people so that the world will see why the gospel is good news. Because you have not forgotten your world, and you are at work in your world, and you have witnesses in your world, in your people. Help your people to be witnesses to your great truth. People full of gratitude because of the life you've given them. Committed to holiness so they can show that they belong to you. People who are committed to seeking the good of everyone and loving within the church deeply from the heart. May this be evident of your people in this time and beyond. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Again, we want to thank Dr. Baker for a very great message that he shared with us our distinctive path, a distinctive vision, a distinctive salvation, and a distinctive lifestyle. Just want to key in on the word salvation. The Lord has provided a great salvation for all of us. His precious son came and went to the cross and died for our sins. And we would not want anybody to listen to our video today, our tape today, and not accept Christ as your personal savior. So if you have not, not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, Take a few moments to invite him in. And if you invite him in, he'll come in. He will be your Savior and Lord. He will forgive you for your sins, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be imputed to your account so that when you stand before the Lord, that you'll be dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so I trust that if you're listening to us today and have not accepted Christ for the first time, that you would do that. Let us say amen. Again, I want to thank you, Dr. Baker, for the word that you've given to us. I want to thank all of you who have joined us today, and we ask that you would invite others to join us uh, because we try to worship while we are apart, and we praise God for this uh, technology that he's given us so that we can still worship while we are apart. May the Lord bless you. Hope that you can visit with us on next time. Keep God focused, and remember that he's the one that we are to look to in this crisis time. Let us all say amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let us say amen. God bless you until next time. Yeah.